Hello, everybody. I'm Michelle Thompson, W5NYB, and I'm here to tell you all about what Open Research Institute has been up to and show you a demonstration of part of one of our projects. Open Research Institute, or ORI, is a nonprofit research and development organization which provides all of its work to the general public under the principles of open source and open access to research. These mean particular things. Open source is a type of intellectual property management where everything you need to recreate or modify a design is freely available. There's some other requirements, and you can find out more from the Open Source Initiative, an organization that certifies open source licenses. All we do is open source work, primarily for amateur radio space and terrestrial, but also some other fields, as you will see. So who are we? Well, here's our current board of directors of five and our immediate past CEO, Bruce Perrins. We have several other very wonderful advisors, and we thank them all the time. We are experienced in management, engineering, operations, and technology, and three out of five are from underrepresented groups in STEM. As a board, it is our mission to serve our participants, developers, and community members. We now have at least 535 that participate in what we call the open source triad, our mailing list, Slack, and GitHub. All work is organized in projects or initiatives. We have some affiliations and we ascribe to the Open Space Manifesto from Libra Space Foundation. We work with several radio clubs, several universities, and have worked with a variety of for-profits. What do we do? Here's a visual summary of top-level projects and initiatives. The vertical axis is risk. Higher risk projects are at the top. Lower risk projects are at the bottom. Maturity increases from left to right. Maturity may indicate schedule, but the score is also influenced by complexity or difficulty. We also use the technology readiness level scale that's often used with the National Science Foundation. The color of the shape indicates how much stress that project is under or what the risk level is at this time. The size of the shape is the budget estimate. By far, the largest budget and the riskiest and the least mature work is in the aquaphage project, which is an open source bacteriophage research and development. Bacteriophage are viruses that attack and destroy bacteria. This is a biomedical and not an amateur radio project. This project was halted by COVID and has not yet resumed. Our digital multiplexing payload project is called P4DX, and it's in the middle in green. This is a multiple access microwave digital regenerating repeater for space and terrestrial development. Tonight's demonstration is of part of the downlink of P4DX that can also be used as a terrestrial multimedia beacon. The M17 project is an open source VHF UHF radio protocol. Think open source digital mode HTs and repeaters. This project is only slightly more stressed than P40X, but it's further along in maturity because it's narrower in scope. We believe the M17 project will be very successful from current development to scaling up to commercial product launch. The M17 protocol is the native digital uplink protocol with some modifications for 5 gigahertz for P40X. Engineers General is our initiative to hire highly competent open source workers to reduce burnout and increase quality in open source work that's important to amateur radio. We have one contractor currently, eight resumes, and have applied for funding for two more. We are actively looking for funding for the remaining five. The Bird Bath is a large dish antenna at the Huntsville Space and Rocket Center. This dish was used in the past for demonstrations and amateur activity but it has been parked for decades. It took two years of negotiation, but ORI has the support of the museum and permission to begin work renovating this dish for citizen science and amateur radio educational use. Work parties from earlier this year were rescheduled due to COVID. The first one will be in December of 2021. Upper right, there are two completed projects. One is ITAR, E-A-R, regulatory work. It took well over a year, but we received a determination from the State Department that open source satellite work is free of ITAR, free
free of EAR and that publishing on the internet counts as publishing under the regs. This is a huge step forward for not just amateur radio, but anyone that wants to contribute to open source space work. Debris mitigation regulatory work took 10 months to complete. The process culminated in a highly successful meeting with the FCC Wireless Telecommunications Board, the Office of Engineering Technology, and the Satellite Bureau this past Thursday. Our first orbit workshop based on this work was earlier today. Lower right is battery matching, a project that matches NICAD cells for very durable batteries in the style that used to be done in amateur satellites. It puts the methods and the documentation in the public domain. Ambisat-inspired sensors used to be on the bottom right, but now it's bumped back a bit in maturity level and more stressed and higher risk. This was supposed to be a project done by students at Vanderbilt University, but no students have materialized, primarily due to COVID. We have one kick-butt professional volunteer who is working on a 10 gigahertz beacon sensor that fits into the sensor connector on the main board. But we wanted to spin the main board to move it from the illegal ISM band it was on to the legal 70 centimeter ham band for space. We are now looking at doing a packed bounty or contract to get this done and close out the project. Ambisat is an excellent educational platform and totally open source. All of these projects are open source and all work is published as it's created. When? Well, we have timelines. We were incorporated in February of 2018 got our 501c3 in March of 2019, and we hit the ground running and haven't stopped since. We'll distribute a copy of the slides so you can see our wins and losses along the way. There's a lot packed in here, any one of which could probably be a full presentation. Here's what's been going on since March and the future plans we know about. We use Agile Framework for Management. And most of us have some sort of formal certification, either completed or in process. This is the Agile Manifesto, and it's the foundation of how our board decides things and how it supports project leads and volunteers. Note the second item, and put in the word hardware instead of software, and that's one of the reasons we demonstrate early and often and incorporate the feedback quickly. So we might be agile with a little bit of lean, but we also work in some traditional waterfall management techniques as well. Here's the SWAT, Foursquare, for P40X. These four grids quite often interact. Opportunities are often ringed by threats, and threats can reveal opportunities. Weaknesses can be compensated by developing overlooked strengths, and so on. We've weathered several major threats, and things keep progressing. For an amateur radio project like P40X, there are a lot of amateur radio-specific challenges, such as the regulatory environment, which we have changed for the better, and a variety of threats from other organizations with radically different agendas. Where are we? Here's the locations of the concentrations of current major contributors and participants. So when we say international, we mean it. Our participants have a wide range of ages, are generally educated, generally in engineering, come from a variety of backgrounds, but do tend to be relatively young and male. We have some physical locations that are important for carrying out the work we do. Remote labs are lab benches connected to the internet that allow direct access to advanced lab equipment and two different large Xilinx development boards and DVBS2 and S2X gear. In a few days, we start the process of moving Remote Lab East to its new location, and we're adding an interferometry site for amateur radio and public science use. And this relocated lab will be called Remote Lab South. We purchased Open Lunar Foundation's satellite lab. It's in storage, waiting for the M17 project lab construction to conclude, and then the equipment will go there to pack that lab full of wonderful test equipment, materials, and supplies. Why do this? We believe that an open source approach to things like amateur digital communications, bacteriophage research, and sticking up for the non-commercial use of space will result in the best possible outcome for the good of humanity. We have a lightweight, agile approach to doing things. We keep our overhead very low, we are radically participant-focused, and the work must be internationally accessible. What is next? Here's a comparison of the major next steps from six months ago to today. 
You can see that public demonstrations and regulatory work are given a high priority. Working code and working hardware are highly valued. And working, to us, means working over the air. As you have seen, one of our projects is a multiple access broadband digital system at microwave that is designed to be used in very high altitude payloads in space or terrestrially. Channels divided in frequency are the uplink. The uplink is on 5 gigahertz. The processor on the payload digitizes and multiplexes these signals and uses DVB-S2 and S2X as a single time division downlink. The downlink is on 10 gigahertz. The system adapts to channel conditions and handles things like quality of service decisions. For example, low and high latency digital content. The uplink is divided up using a polyphase channelizer, which opens the possibility of reconfiguring uplink channels in orbit or in the field. While most amateur television systems use the MPEG transport stream, we replaced this with another DVB protocol called generic stream encapsulation so that any type of data is efficiently transmitted. The end-to-end -end system is coming together in an FPGA-based design that can then become a custom ASIC. Part of the system is a default digital downlink. When there is no or light traffic, we want to play signals that run through all the combinations of modulations and forward error correction coding so that people can fully test their receivers. This payload function is essentially a beacon, so we are making a small number of them. This is an early prototype, and it will go up in Southern California as quickly as possible. When we say broadband, we mean on the order of 10 megahertz. The symbol rate is fixed, and the modulation and error correction coding vary to allow different capability stations experiencing different channel conditions to close the loop. This is called adaptive coding and modulation. For this prototype, we are only using an MPEG transport stream, but generic data is the goal. The beacon signal is 5 megahertz wide, and we are using one modulation and one error coding so far. We are not yet rotating through all the allowed combinations in DVB, S2, and S2X yet. And here is Paul Williamson, KB5MU, with a demonstration of the hardware and software involved. Hi, I'm Paul, KB5MU. I have a demo for you. Before that, let me tell you one thing. When I recorded this demo, I kept saying samples per second when I should have been saying symbols per second. So just ignore that and substitute symbols per second whenever I say samples per second. Now, let's go with the demo. This is the demo setup. On the left, the transmitter simulating a satellite. And on the right, the receiver simulating a user's ground station. Let's take a closer look. The big box here is just a computer. A fairly high powered computer, but we don't need that here. It's connected by USB, this blue cable, to this box here, which is a Blade RF, a lab grade SDR, capable of operating from low frequencies up to about 6 gigahertz. We're using it at UHF around 440 megahertz. And that IF signal comes out through this cable and into this box which is a DB6NT 10 gigahertz transverter designed for ham radio use, transmit and receive, but we're using it just for transmit. And through this little tiny cable we're going to this antenna, which is a slotted waveguide antenna. If you look carefully, you'll see that there are slots in the side of the waveguide. Each one of those slots is just the right length to be a dipole at 10 gigahertz. So you get all these dipoles in phase, giving you gain in the vertical direction, and yet an omnidirectional pattern horizontally. These were machined by the late W6DFW. So all we got to do is generate the signal in the box, in the computer, create the RF of the signal here in the late RF, and then upconvert it to 10 gigahertz. That's very similar to how an actual implementation of this beacon will work.
although none of these boxes are probably going to appear in a real deployable implementation. On the other side, we have a typical receive station. These are off-the-shelf components, which we've chosen to make it easy to, to do the demo, but also very similar to what you'd have in a final user station. The 10 gigahertz work is handled by this low noise block down converter. This is the same sort of thing you'd see at the feed point of a dish for satellite TV. And these are dirt cheap. So many of them have been made that it's uh, very inexpensive. It comes out at UHF around 600 and something megahertz. And that goes through this piece of coaxial cable to this little shiny silver box, which is a mini tuner express. This box was manufactured for ham radio use for digital amateur television. Uh, and they're quite inexpensive. They were only about $75. Unfortunately, they're no longer available, but uh, a replacement product is in the pipeline right now and hopefully will also be quite affordable. And it's connected by USB to a Windows laptop. So let's dive in. Starting over here at the receive station. All I have to do is double click on the mini tuner software. It detects the device and then brings up this screen full of instrumentation. This shows how the receiver is getting along. Right now it's not getting along very well at all because it's not set up correctly. Plus there's no signal for it to receive. You can see here in this box that it's searching across a range of frequencies, trying to find the signal at the frequency that it's looking at, which is not the right frequency either. And here it's got an estimate of noise and all sorts of interesting data. This picture down here is especially interesting. This is what's called a constellation diagram. It's a plot of signal amplitude in terms of brightness and phase and amplitude in terms of angle around the chart and distance from the center. Uh, you can see right now it's all full of speckles, no visible pattern to them. That's just the noise. So let me set up a couple of parameters. Up here in the upper left hand corner, we have the sample rate, which is 5 million samples per second. This is in thousands, so I put in 0, 05000, 0, 0, 0, 5000 kilosamples per second. And then the frequency. We picked a frequency off the, uh, the band plan for 10 gigahertz. Uh, there's no entry in the band plan for broadband beacons, but there is uh, an area in the band plan that's for broadband. So we chose one of those frequencies and uh, maybe you have to choose a different one before we're done, but that's the one we're using right now. So one, zero, 10 gigahertz, three, seven seven five zero zero kilohertz so just above the weak signal area of the band so now we're on frequency and we got the right sample right it's still searching for the signal because i haven't turned the transmitter on yet and these indicators down here at the bottom you can see there's no carrier lock the symbol rate lock is bouncing around but not really good we've got low rf power at minus 80 and the carrier to noise is, is negligible, pretty close to zero. And these happiness indicators are all red and unhappy because there's no signal. Let's see if we can fix that. Go over to the transmitter. Here we are at the transmit station. All I have to do is run GNU Radio Companion it brings up this lovely chart, which is a graphical representation of the program that it's gonna run to do all the digital signal processing. Uh, the signal starts here at the file source block. This block is just reading the video from a file on the computer. This is video that's been pre-compressed and arranged into what's called an MPEG transport stream which is exactly the format it needs to be transmitted in over whatever kind of uh, broadcast or non-broadcast radio medium 
uh, you're going to send it on. And this feeds into a block called BB header, which uh, arranges that data into baseband blocks and adds a header to them. Those are then run through a scrambler, a BCH encoder, and finally an LDPC encoder. That stands for Low Density Parity Check, and that's really where the magic is for DDBS2. The low Density Parity Check is a state-of-the-art encoder which comes very, very close to the theoretical limit of performance of signal-to-noise ratio and bit rate. These, the parameters used by these encoders are variable. That's one of the neat things about DBBS2. In this case, we've got them set for a particular uh, kind of coding and a particular kind of modulation. The signal comes over here to the interleaver and a modulator, which is where the actual modulation takes place. It's set, you may be able to read it, it says 16 APSK and 9 slash 10. So it's a constellation of possible signals being used. There are 16 of them. They vary in both amplitude and phase. So it's amplitude and phase shift keying with 16 possibilities. And the code rate is 9 tenths, which is pretty fast. So relatively minimal uh, error correction capability. Still quite good, but uh, not a lot of overhead. The signal goes over here to the physical layer framer, which arranges it in such a way that it can actually be transmitted. And then there's a final filter to take all the nasty edges off. And this signal goes two places. It goes to this block, which creates a visualization of the signal, which we'll see here in a second. And this block, which interfaces with the, uh, the SDR hardware, the blade RF in this case. So all I have to do to, to run this program is click Go. So I'm clicking Go. We'll see some stuff scroll by as it initializes. And then the, uh, the frequency sync visualizer pops up. And it shows a nice square signal. This is what all high performance digital signals look like, kind of flat on the top with steep sides. Uh, this signal has uh, nice tapered edges. This is uh, on purpose. It helps minimize the interference between adjacent channel signals. And that's part of the uh, part of the design of DBS2. So now that we're transmitting a signal, the receiver is much happier. We come over here and look at the receiver. We'll see uh, that the carrier lock is full smash at 100, and so is the symbol rate lock. The RF power is up, and the the C over N is very high about 22. It needs about 14, so we've got about 8 dB of margin, which is what this D8 here means. And the decoder is happy, all green. And lo and behold, there's video and audio. This block, di this, uh, this pie chart here shows how the bits are being utilized. With 5,000 kilosamples per second, and 16 APSK modulation and a rate 9 tenths code, we're able to put 17.4 million bits per second through this channel of about 6 megahertz wide. That's more than bit, more bits than we need for this file. Uh, in fact, the pie, pie chart shows that we're using about 5% uh, of the bits for the video and 2.4 percent for high definition audio and the rest is being wasted with null packets so we could be using more bits and doing more stuff here uh, without additionally straining the system at all let's take a closer look at this video if i go into this mode i lose some of the instrumentation but i get a much closer look at the video take a look over here at the on the right side that tells you the resolution of the video. It's 1920 by 1080, otherwise known as 1080p, or full HD. If I hit another key, I'll bring the video up to full screen. That is a very pretty picture. Now this, this is black and white, but that's not a limitation of the demo. It's just the, the file. It's actually being transmitted in full color. It happens that this particular music video is 
all black and white because the footage is old mostly. That is not the kind of picture you expect to see on amateur television using analog means. In fact, that's, uh, that's quite impressive in my book. That's a very nice picture. I'll go back to the instrumentation screen. Um, there are other features that is programming. Don't need to go through them all. Just the fact that we're able to send this many bits reliably over microwave is what the demo is about. Now, the interesting thing, well, one limitation that we're, of this demo that I'm showing you right now is that the video is pre-canned. I had to create a file, or actually a colleague of ours created the file for us, um, and it has to be arranged for a particular bit rate, a particular uh, sample rate, and so on, a particular modulation encoding. And if you don't have an appropriate file, then this actual demo won't won't do anything for you. But we're also capable of doing live video with this system. So come back here to the transmitter. I'm going to stop the flow graph. And if we we'll peek at the receiver again, you'll see that the picture is gone and the signals are back down to nothing. Um, I'm going to switch to a slightly different flow graph. This flow graph is almost identical, but it, it gets the video from a named pipe instead of from a file. And I come over here to this window and I run a little script that generates the video to the named pipe. And this video is coming from the webcam, this webcam here on top of the screen. So that's now generating the video. All I have to do is come over here and run the flow graph. Once again, we'll see pretty much the same sort of display. The spectrum looks the same regardless of what you're transmitting, really. That's a feature. <laughs> and over here you can see the, uh, the video being generated frame by frame. And if we go back over to the receiver, you'll see that it's back on again. The, uh, the carrier lock is, is full smash, and so is the symbol rate lock, and our power is out. We've got 8 dB of margin, or 9, depending, and the constellation diagram is very pretty. Uh, it'll take a few seconds to actually lock onto the video. I'm not sure why this takes time to lock on, but the limitation of the video codecs involved. There it is. Okay, so this is live video. That's me working on the camera gear and running the demo. One thing you can probably tell from my hand motions and from the, uh, the audio you see versus my lips, there's a delay. There's about three seconds of delay with this configuration. That's not ideal. We would hope to, hope to do better in a final implementation. Uh, but this off-the-shelf thing is designed mainly for broadcast and uh, where the delay really doesn't matter. But this is showing that I'm able to take raw video out of, off a webcam, encode it, create the transport stream, and then run it through all this modulation encoding in an ordinary PC. And this also shows that there's glitches in the system. Sometimes it flakes out. I'd like to be able to explain to you exactly what's going on there, but I don't know yet. There's still work to be done to make this reliable. I don't know whether it's the transmitter or the receiver even. It will fix itself here in a few seconds. Or not. Here we go. <laughs> it just came back. I don't know what the issue is with that, but interesting, huh? There's never a, never a dull moment when it comes to complicated systems like this. I just want to show you one or two other things. First, this the transverter you can see here in the transmit subsystem uh, is putting out 10 gigahertz. Uh, and we're running 10 gigahertz from the this little antenna to that little antenna just a few feet. 
but there's also UHF on both sides. And how do you know that it's not the UHF leaking across? Well, I'm going to try to prove that to you. First of all, I'm going to turn off the transverter. There's a little switch here. I'll just turn off the transverter without touching any of the other settings. And on the receive side, you'll see that the signal is gone. So it's not receiving the UHF. It's actually receiving a 10 gigahertz. When we turn it back on, the signal should pop back in. You can see the constellation comes up pretty well, although it's, it takes a while because there's a filter on the constellation diagram. And it takes a little while after that for the video codec to, to figure out what's going on. Come on, video. Here we go. Okay, now, I've, now I'm on video. I'm going to try one other thing to try to convince you that it's really 10 gigahertz going on. I'm just going to put my hand in front of the receive antenna. And whoa, signal's gone, just like microwave. After a short delay, the signal is back again. And this pretty much concludes the demo. I've got data going back and forth and live video. But let me show you one other thing. Go back to the full instrumentation screen here, which I can do by clicking this little red switch. And look at the pie chart now with this full HD signal that I'm encoding on the fly rather than carefully encoding offline. I'm using 34.5% of the signal to uh, send the video. So my video data rate is about 6 million bits per second. But I've still got 11.5 million bits per second that I'm wasting. So you can see that even if everybody sends video, there's room for multiple users. And if people are sending uh, smaller amounts of data, like say just a voice conversation, there would be room for lots and lots and lots of users on this one downlink. The exact parameters, of course, would depend on how big your dish is and how strong the signal from the satellite is. Um, so this particular demo is not to be taken too literally as exactly how things are going to work, but it does give you an idea of what's possible. That concludes the video demo. Thank you for your attention, and I hope we'll be able to show you something really cool, even cooler than this, next time we present. 7-3.